I'm so glad to talk to you both. I'm very excited. Um, we have a lot to talk about, and unfortunately, we can't get to questions, but I got plenty. Um, I think we have to start with you, Jamie. You're up oh, for Oh, your... fuck. What, really? What do you mean, oh, fuck? <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> Don't be more difficult oh, than I'm Elon f- Musk, because I have ways okay. of dealing with that. Um, so you're up for your first Oscar. I am. Your role for Deirdre. Uh, in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Uh, will you win? <laughs> yes. No. I, I, I'll be honest with you. Okay. Um, I, the whole season of Shiny Things yeah. um, uh, has just been uh, a bit of a blur for me because mm-hmm. who I am as a human being, I started out in horror films. The idea of going to the Oscars was never going to be. I'm a genre actor. I'm in horror films. I'm in comedies. I've been naked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, yeah. and because of that, I just didn't... You've seen didn't, you naked. Go ahead. And I sold yogurt that makes you shit for six years. Yes. yes. For money. <laughs> yeah. So I could stay home and take care of my kids. So the truth of the matter is I never thought the Oscars were going to be right. a, something associated with me. So I have never uh, allowed myself even a glimmer of... So you're it. not even going to say, yes, of course I'm fucking going to win. You're going to obviously win. I really don't think that's going to happen. And the tr- here's the only thing I'll say about the Oscars, because it's the only tangible thing, and I'm a tangible gal. Right, okay. The women who I am in a competition with, which mm. is not my competition, um, have become friends of mine okay. through this process of Zooms and meetings right. and going to panels. <coughs> I actually now know them. Yeah. And they've become human and kind. Oh. And so the truth is, I don't care. Oh. Whoever wins it, all of those women are lovely right. women. They've all worked hard. All right. They have all hustled. They've all had heartbreak. All right. Can so I, for me, that's the great takeaway. Can I see your I won face? <laughs> well, if you, if you followed me, Kara, yeah. on all the I've social medias you. that I invented. I have been watching you on the social medias. <laughs> then you will have seen yeah. the actual shock and dis, like, awe right. of the right. moment that my name was called on Oscar morning when my girlfriend, Deborah Oppenheimer, came over to hold my yep. hand and took a photograph of me, um, without me knowing it, that was shocked. All right, we will talk about that okay. because it seems like you're having a blast. I'm, you know what? If like, I'm not having a blast doing this, then what the fuck am I ever going to have a blast doing? <laughs> that is like, this is the, should be the greatest time of my life. And so far, up until today, it... <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> No worries. It's been great. <laughs> All right. So, Donna, your Studio Universal is also nominated, by the way, for a lot of things. Steven Spielberg's biopic, The Fablemans, Tar, with Tar. six nominations. Um, I, I, and Puss in Boots. Puss in Boots. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, Tar, I, you need to explain it to me. And I went as a lesbian and still don't understand it. <laughs> um, but how important are the Oscars for the studios now, especially when you compete with streamers like Netsket? Netflix, excuse me. So, you know, the, the, so there's two ways to look at this whole awards craziness, right? right? There's the awards themselves and what they mean, and then there's the business of it. The awards themselves and what they mean is meaningful. Um, you know, to be recognized by your industry peers, uh, you know, and to be rewarded and awarded for that is, is amazing. It's wonderful. Um, you know, we were all at the Academy lunch the other day, which is this, inc- it's, it's one of the best events of the whole endless awards season, um, where all of the nominees get together and they have lunch and it's very democratic because you don't sit at the table of your movie, you get to sit with all different kinds of people. You meet people from all over the world who have, you know, they're being recognized for excellence in their field, whether it's visual effects or sound editing or, you know, whatever it is. So it, you're reminded that this is, you know, we're an industry of craftsmen and artists and creative people. And so I think that's the really amazing part of it. And that's the part of it that sometimes gets lost along the right, way. Right, because this it's whole, become a spectacle, it's a become media a spectacle. marketing spectacle. Right. And the spectacle is okay if it's in service of, you know, 
the sort of export business, if you will, that Hollywood is and Hollywood right. movies are, where it where it, it, it sort of become less relevant in a way, where it's become less relevant in a number of ways. The shows themselves obviously don't get the viewership that they used to, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of reasons why. But the business of it, it used to be that, you know, you would release kind of Academy movies at the end of the year, and then they would be in the movie theaters, and then the awards would come out, and then people would be driven to go and see them in the movie theaters. Now with Collapse Window, you can see everything at home. It's just become less of a, a sort of financial business proposition. Right. Um, you know, so that window of, you know, getting nominated to, you know, potentially winning used to be pretty lucrative. It's not anymore. It's not. It's not the thing that not makes really, these not, movies. Go, it's not, it's not really them. why you do it. No, definitely not. Definitely not. So mm -hmm. just the lunch, essentially. It's just a lunch. It's right. Great, it's right. great lunch. I heard not, you, not particularly good food. Jamie, I heard company. you had a thing with Tom Cruise there. You're well, by the way, who saved <laughs> show business? Right. Tom Cruise with right. Top Gun. I mean, right. Jerry Bruckheimer. I mean, right. that movie was such a big success. It really Financial. did establish that people will go back to the movies. Yeah. Um, as they did, by the way, with everything, everywhere, all at once. I yes. think yes, the best picture did. of 2022. I mean, I don't know if that was a plug or not, but maybe yeah. it was, because maybe there's a voter in here. <laughs> yeah, okay. And the voting opened today, and we are sitting in the Academy Theater. Okay, all right. And if that isn't a connect the dot, I'm not sure what is. Um, <laughs> Um, I did run into him. Uh, I don't know him. Uh, I was walking through, uh, it's too long of a story, but my daughter was in there and I was trying to get to her because they sort of separate you, uh, the nominees to get your picture taken, blah, blah, blah. And as I was, is it time up already? No, no, it's just a reminder about death. <laughs> I was going to say, wow. No, I have, a death, I have a death reminder every go Okay, and good. Right. Um, and as I was walking through to get to my table, I heard off my left side, hey, Jamie, and I turned around, and it was Tom. And we don't know each other, but we know each other because the two of us have been doing this for a very long yes. time in fields that don't get the gold, shiny things. Mm -hmm. um, we have both been... Hanging from helicopters. Hanging from helicopters, doing stunts, but also... Doing genre movies and movies that generate a lot of money for um, it, the economy of the of the movie business, but they are overlooked. Um, and so there we were, these two veterans. Uh, kind of, he grabbed my face. He said, "Can you believe we're here?" Wow. And I said, "No, I can't." Did he it was jump beautiful. up and down? Say again. Did he jump up and down? <laughs> he was enthusiastic. Okay, good. Okay, just want I want to make sure on brand. So one of the things, you know, Tom Cruise is a huge star. He's done rather well with that movie. Yes. at least financially, and actually critically in a lot of ways. Um, but very few women have been nominated for Best Picture, none for Best Director category. It's kind of hard not to ask, why is that? And should the Academy consider gendered categories for director, for example? Donna, why don't you take that first? You know, I, it, I mean, it's... You've got to start from the, the gender disparity is a problem, mm -hmm. and it's been a problem for a long time, and there are remedies that uh, have been tried that are clearly not resonating or not working. Um, you know, the thing we have to do is we have to support more women early on in their careers so they can actually get to the point where, you know, they're getting the opportunities, they're getting the foot in the door. Uh, you know, it's incredibly difficult for women in particular, studies show, you know, they can get their first movie made, but to get from the first to the second is really, really difficult. You know, so I think just as an industry, we, we've got to continue to do that. In terms of sort of passing up the categories, you know, I, maybe, maybe that's an answer. You know, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think, again, it sort of comes to this thing, people need to be recognized, the criteria of what you're recognizing in this whole awards thing mm -hmm. is it's got to be the excellence of the work. It has to be... right. You well, know, it's in that regard, to Jimmy, that. what about dismantling gender divides for actor categories? So it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, after in the next segment a little mm -hmm. bit with Alok. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also the parent of a, of a trans daughter, and I, I also lean toward um, when our daughter was looking for secondary school, we looked at a girl's school. Mm -hmm. And the studies and all the data shows that young women get very quiet 
when there are boys around once they become teenagers. Mm -hmm. It's just the male dominance right. is so powerful that it shuts them down emotionally and intellectually. Eight years old, I'm actually. sorry? It's eight years old, but go ahead. keep. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I, I was my, well, the reason why I was saying uh, high school is yeah. because we were applying for right, high school. Right, right, yeah. And of course my daughter did not want to go <laughs> to single sex right. um, high school. But my husband and I had the conversation about it because I understand that. So that's where I, um, I'm, I'm, because I'm a trans parent, right. I will always be on the side of inclusivity. Mm -hmm. But in the criteria of trying to separate genders for categories, I'm concerned that women will lose out. Lose out, yes. That's and for me, the gains made by women need to be supported not diminished. Right. And um, and so that would be my business take on it. But yet as a parent, yeah, I want when with all of these questions, mm -hmm. it has to be inclusivity first because excluding is the thing right. that is so damaging and dangerous. Right. right, right. So you wouldn't, I, I don't think they would change it at all, but it, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, for instance... Acting is acting, right? For instance... The Independent Spirit Awards have combined gender categories. It is best performance in a supporting role. Mm -hmm. And I am up against Ki, Kwan, mm -hmm. and many others. Right, um, who was in, amazing in your movie. Who's amazing in the movie and has been a leader in a lot of the uh, winnings mm -hmm. of the gendered categories. Mm -hmm. So there's an example of this weekend, we will have an award show where it's an inclusive um, category. So it makes it more difficult in that regard. Again, I just think yeah. the, the, the choices for women um, need to be supported because it's your to your point about yeah. the business of movies and women directors. Well, let's talk about that business because you, you, besides this renaissance in your career that started, it really started with the reboot of the Halloween series in 2018. Maybe you don't agree with me about that. Oh, no, of course talk, I do. Talk about that, the idea of doing that. Because it's also a business story, because it was such a, an enormous... Uh, well, it's given me my entire creative life. The woman you see sitting here today who's a boss with a capital B <laughs> is because Jason Blum gave me a deal. He, pr he produced all three. He okay. produced all three, and the first one, the 2018 Halloween, was such a monster success mm -hmm. that when I said to him, well... I have a movie I'd like to write and direct. I have ideas. Can I have a home uh, to do it in? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, they call it a first look deal, which is right. not a lot of money, gives you a little bit of housekeeping money. Mm -hmm. But what you do is you bring them your first look right. at whatever it is creatively that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that has given me a platform, the platform I have never had up until, what was it, five years ago? Yeah. Um, and that then has launched me because I've been that ideal girl my whole life. I want, as you know, I want to talk about I your idea, girl. We're, by the way, Jamie has two patents. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about that in a second. But um, Donna, why do you think it was the right time to revive it? Now, obviously, horror films, I've interviewed Jason, um, are inexpensive. They also can do incredibly well. It's a really good, if it works, it works beautifully. But why revive it? Talk about your decision making around that. Well, um, it, I cannot take credit for the decision to revive it. It came to me via a deal with Jason Blum, with already packaged with uh, David Gordon Green writing and directing, and so it came to us as a fully fledged thing. That, of course, you know, we said yes to. We didn't hesitate. Um, what we were really excited about, though, is this idea that it was. I'm borrowing this from our head of marketing, Michael Moses, who is, you know number one fan of, of this lady right here. Uh, they're an incredible partnership um, as a requel. So it's a sort of a, a reboot um, sequel. Mm -hmm. And really what that means is we were taking the, char the character, this amazing character of Laurie Strode and putting her front and center back into the franchise. Now, obviously she'd been in the franchise in various different yeah. incarnations along the way, but this was sort of going back to the, the kind of the, the core canon of what launched the franchise of that, the, the sort of essence of it, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we got really, really excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it 
reboots don't work, right? They don't. No, no, they don't. But Often we, they don't. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, more times yeah. than not that they, they don't because they, you know they can feel like a cynical offering to the audience. They can just. But the, again, this just felt like there, there was a purity to to the concept and to the idea. And I'm, in fact, our, our first piece of anything on the movie was a picture of, of Jamie as, as Laurie, yeah. um, you know, however many years later. And right. it just blew up. You what know, do you think inter- worked internet. about it in that regard? Is it because she was at the center of it or what the purity, when you, what does that mean? In- well, I mean, Jamie can probably speak more eloquently about the mythology of the whole series, but it, it was, it was, I mean, look, it, the essence of it, it's a revenge story. You're, you know, you're, you're picking up on this, on, on this kind of cat and mouse between these two characters that, you know, if you were fans of that original, you were, get, you were going to get to see play itself out. Um, you know, so I, I think, I think for core fans, but it became, it became more than that. And it really did become something that was, we could never have anticipated this. It was a sort of, it wasn't a comeback story because you didn't go anywhere, but it was a, it was an emergent story. It mm-hmm. was, it was, and, and we, we call Jamie, um, a weapon of, of mass promotion. <laughs> and, and, and really we just sort of let her go and, and have this very direct right. conversation with now, the audience. You, you don't even like horror films. I don't, I, I you abhor know, them. By the way, I, the reason... <laughs> no, I abhor them and thank them. <laughs> yes. You know, um, in equal parts. Uh, you know what happened? And I'm sure you've seen the meme, and if you haven't yeah. seen the meme, you're certainly not techies. Right. Trauma. You see, it was right when Me Too mm-hmm. was happening, mm-hmm. and women all over the world were saying, this happened to me, I am taking back the power. Mm-hmm. And this was a story of Laurie Strode mm-hmm. taking back her power. And the confluence right. of the women's movement, Me Too, the destruction of the men in powerful positions, or the beginning of the destruction, and a woman over the age of 55 standing up with a rifle saying, you know, me too, motherfucker, and let's go. And that did ignite, because the movie was great, but really the wave was women taking back the power. And did you feel that way in the first one? I'll tell you why I hate horror movies. It's because of your movie. I was dating a a guy, and uh, during the movie, he he had, I know, exactly. (laughs) And he had seen the movie before, and so he got up during that one, there's one scene where someone jumps out of somewhere. Oh, a couple. And I know, but the first time, and he grabbed my feet from behind at that moment, and that's when I became a lesbian. um, (laughs) It was terrible, but what... um, why do you do them though? Because you think they are, they are big. They're mythology. I had stopped doing them, and as you know, have tried to do other things, and well, certainly did, did plenty of other things. things. And uh, uh, it was the last thing I thought I would do when yeah. David Gordon Green called me. But then he told me what he was doing, and the truth of the matter is that you know it's 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 I, I can say it in here. I I because I, I said it for the first time yesterday at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, where I am a a big advocate and Mm -hmm. supporter. I've made my living on violence and I'm like the least violent person you would ever know. Mm -hmm. I am the softest person. I am the easiest cry Mm -hmm. in the room. And I've made my living on violence. And I'm I'm happy I no longer have to make my living on violence. I've done it. I honored the fans. I honored the genre. I certainly... Mm -hmm. Was, it was good business. It was the last thing I thought I would do. We ended up doing three of them. They were wildly yep. successful. And the best part is that that violence has given birth now to me having to be able to do this. a position of being a boss at 64 <laughs> years old, which wow, is that's thrilling. And also take this motherfucker. Um, speaking of violence, Universal's movie Cocaine Bear just beat <laughs> uh, box office expectations. Opening weekend, the trailer going viral practically probably helped. Critics were less friendly. Some were liked it, some liked it, but the Times Review subheading was the greatest joke of this blood spattered horror comedy from Elizabeth Banks is that it exists. Um, <laughs> I'm all for Cocaine Bear. I, I, we made a big deal of it on our podcast this week. Directed yep. by a woman. <laughs> yes, indeed. Correct. Indeed. What, tell us about making it. Uh, look, it's making money. It's making a ton of money. I'm not, I shouldn't be embarrassed. You know, I, I hope my bosses don't get to hear this. Um, 
the script came to us by producers Lord and Miller, mm-hmm. who are brilliantly funny and inventive and wild. And we knew that um, they were never going to bring us anything that was, you know, no- regular. <laughs> that it was, you know, that it was always going to be a bit left of center. And the script came across my desk called Cocaine Bear. And, um, you know, wh- one, one of our executives walked in and said, you got to read this, go home and read it. I did. And it was right in the middle of COVID. And, you know, thinking back to that time, it was when, you know, productions were really hard. We were all de- dealing with COVID protocols. We didn't really know if people were ever going to come back to a movie theater. All we knew is, you know, we should make things that we thought could get people's attention. Yeah. And we thought Cocaine Bear <laughs> might, might get people's attention. <laughs> and apparently... Um, you know, yeah. and as long as we could use the title, yeah, which we figured out that we could, I mean, you know, a bit of a wing and a prayer, in, you know, in marketing materials. And it was, so it was, a, bit of, it was a greenlit and a bit of a fever dream. I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah. it was definitely like, Whoa, who knows? What like, let's hell? just do it. <laughs> Fuck it. Why nice not? No. It's called Cocaine Bear. And then the marketing campaign became um, very quickly, mm, it was just about a bear that took cocaine. Really In fact, if you look more. at the Super Bowl spot, I think the characters but, you know, say it five times. snakes on a plane did not work. As huh? a, say, no, snakes on a plane did, plane work, did not but work. cocaine bear no. did work. Yeah, and cocaine bear did work. It's yeah. a bear that takes cocaine. Yeah. So um, it was less okay. about story. It was not about a mom yeah. looking for her kids in the woods. It was yeah. about a bear taking cocaine. Okay, good. And marketing. It, marketing. And this is where Michael Moses, yeah. the yeah. reason Michael Moses and I love each other and respect each other is because I understand more than I understand and with all due respect to your job, the, I understand you less than I understand marketing. Marketing, because yeah. I'm like a mar- I'm a marketer. Yeah. I sell yogurt that makes you poop, and it's it. successful. Got it. Got it. I can do. I can sell things. I, I assume the um, the sequel is Ketamine Bear, right? <laughs> no, wait. That's the Twitter story right now. Okay. So moving on. Come on. I'm teasing. Um, in 2019, you found a comet pick up. Uh, pictures of yes. theme, film, TV, and podcast production yes. company with the first deal look. Um, you adapted a book, Paradise, about a California town that was destroyed yes, that, by a wildfire, yep. which we've all read about. Um, you're directing- Lizzie Johnson's book, which yes, there's a story amazing. of a bus driver and a school teacher who saved the life of 23 children. What was happening. They were yeah. the lost bus, which was missing for seven hours. They didn't know what happened. Right, that's the town actually Trump went to and miscalled it something, yes. I recall. You're yes. directing that film. It is directed. No, no, I'm not directing not. that You're film. You're not directing No, I'm going to direct the, the horror, uh, uh, eco-horror film that I wrote called Mother Nature. Which oh, is, she's uh, mad? Oof. <laughs> yeah. Remember that commercial? Remember yeah, the yes. don't mess nice, with Mother don't Nature? Mother Na- yeah. No, they don't. So, no, they don't, because they're young and you're in tech. Yeah. Why yeah. would you have any yeah. reference to it's something? It's not nice to mess with You don't even know what a quaalude is. Right. <laughs> but Jamie can help you later. Um, <laughs> so um, so you, you, want, you want to direct, though? You want to I start? do. I, I would like to do it all. Right. Um, I really am hustling getting stories told because I have a limited time. And I'm not saying that in a morbid way. I'm literally saying it in the actuarial table of my mm-hmm. insurance company's way. You know, <laughs> uh, I know what age my parents died, and I'm 64. Right. And I have a limited amount of time. So the biggest project that I am dealing with you right now. You control, right? You also want to take more control over your process. I want to be able to tell stories and I want to be able to see them from idea to story. Fruition. And the biggest one was just announced is Scarpetta, which is taking the books You've by Patricia Cornwell and um, wow. that Nicole Kidman is going to play Scarpetta and I'm going to play her sister and we're going to make it for Amazon. Right. Um, and that, that was just that again. alone yeah. will... That was quite a get to get those rights. It's and yeah. that's me just hustling. Yeah, Patricia Cornwell's a friend of yours, correct? Uh, I'm. Uh, we are friends, and I never thought that uh, she would give you the. Rights. Well, that was the perfect call with Patricia. Yeah. Hey, when Blumhouse and I were discussing it, I said, "Well, let me talk to her." Hey, Patricia, who has the rights? Well, I do. No, no, I know you have the rights, Patricia. Yeah. I mean, of course you have the rights, but I mean, who owns the rights? I do. No, I. I understand. I'm saying who has the option for the rights? No one. And from there that moment, were. it took a year. Well, but it's good. It. That's a big one. So what you're doing is a backdrop of shifting power, Donna, for example. You shift from actors, producers, change the business and economics. Actors and their agents are increasingly pushing for upfront payments rather than profit participation. 
They're not as reliant on a film's success to get paid. Can you talk a little bit about that shift when you're running a movie company? Because all the economics, yeah. and it's also against the backdrop of a potential writer's strike about to happen. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I think it's important to understand that right now, for the first time in the industry that I've, you know, since I've been in it for over 20 years, 25 years, um, each company does something slightly different. Even the tech companies, um, the streaming companies, their reason for content is different. They're, they're each different. You know, Apple is selling iPhones, Amazon is all about Prime, and Netflix is, you know, just about the content. The traditional movie studios like ours, um, we're doing it slightly, we're each doing it slightly differently. So what's sort of, un what's underneath the, the, the economics is all of the windowing structure, that's how we make our money, it's all in downstream mm -hmm. revenue. So it's less about, the, I mean, it's a lot about the box office, the box office is actually really important, um, but it's all about the ancillary revenue. So <clears throat> those economics for us are what drive all of our decisions in terms of what we spend on content and what we spend on marketing that content. So, um, you know, I, I actually think that that for our studio, we're, we're not too far away from how it's always been done in terms of how we compensate. Mm -hmm. We are less about, you know, we do a combination of, you know, upfront plus back end or, you know, all of those kinds of things. I mean, those deals, the big lucrative first dollar, you mm -hmm. know, if everyone's making a dollar the minute the movie opens. Those are a thing of the past. Those kind of went away at the, during the last um uh, writer's strike, and which coincided with the economic recession. So our economics are very similar, um, but you know what we tend to do is we made a decision not to go. We don't go head to head with the streamers in terms of those big package sales that go mm -hmm. out there and they sell for oodles of money. We well, can't that's drying up, of course, and yeah. it is drying up. But there was a moment in time where we've always been a studio where we've said, you know, we we kind of have to, you know. Our challenges are our, our opportunities, mm -hmm. so we, we never want to be too reliant on the marketplace, if you will. We develop a lot in-house. We rely on our creative partners to, to bring us the things that we're going to end up greenlighting. Do you, it, size matters in Hollywood now, too, though. Um, Amazon acquired so. MGM. There's the Warner Discovery merger. They may merge again. I think they may have to, getting sold to someone like Comcast, um, which already owns NBC Universal. Paramount may be sold. How big is enough in the world of Amazons and Netflixes and Apple TV Pluses? I spoke to Bob Iger in September. And he said Disney might not be big enough. Um, how do you look at that? And I loved from a talent perspective. And then we just got one more question after that because we've got a time. Do you want me to go first? Yes, please. I'll go really far, fast. Um, you know, yes, when you look at the big, e when you look at the ecosystem, size does matter. But we are driven by profitability and it is possible. I'm, I can only really speak about Universal at this mm -hmm. moment and like the Universal Film Studio. We know how to be profitable. We know how many movies we need to make, what they need to make. We know how to sort of manage our business model, our economics, what kind of movies are going to break out, Cocaine Bear, Halloween, genre movies, big animation movies, Jurassic World. We kind of know how to do almost a portfolio approach to our slate in order for us to be profitable and for us You're to be successful. You're not sweating over streaming. We are not sweating over streaming right now. We're not, we right. can't because... You know, I think if we've learned anything in the in the sort of ups and downs of the last few years with all of this disruption, including the pandemic, is at the end of the day, Jamie said it, it's about storytelling. And I know that sounds almost, you know, a romanticized view, but it's not. It is about partnering with content creators. It is about working with best in class, people who are going to cut through to the audience, people who you guys want to show up to a movie theater or pay money or, or you know, put any effort into watching or seeing or viewing anything and, you know, making a slate based on those things. Um, and if you lose sight of that, then you're kind of like but all in on streaming. All, all in on streaming, all in on this, all in on that. The one thing I do know that movies matter when they're in a movie theater and they have a big global campaign behind them and they get that big, you know, that's what makes them culturally relevant. That what That's what makes them last and stand the test of time. It's what makes people relevant who are in them and who have made them. And I think it's what makes an audience kind of excited to Although engage with them. streaming can be exciting. How do you think I of know. it as I think well, in TV, I, I, have, I think in TV it can happen in streaming. It happens yes. less in mo with movies. Yes. Um, uh, my answer is everything everywhere all at once, which yeah. was made That's for right. $12.5 million for right dollars now today. in 
38 days yeah. in Simi Valley, California, in the old um, countrywide savings and loan uh, campus. Mm -hmm. And that movie has made over $100 million in box office because of the content of the creation of these artists. And I'm very happy to say that the Daniels, who are the young filmmakers who made it, are going to make their have made their home universal because they recognized that's how this works. So how do you think of it? You've got this streaming deal with Amazon, you've got this. As a talent person and someone who's now a producer, what, how do you look at what to pick from? I just want to get it done. Right. I'm, I know it sounds terrible. I've saved money, you guys. I've actually saved the money I've made. I don't, I'm, this isn't about money for me. Right. This is about creativity. It's about seeing something through to the end. It's about having opportunities to be a boss, to be able to tell the kind of stories I want to tell. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And the you business part, believe Amazon, me, my lawyer Apple. would not like me to be saying this to you since we're still in negotiations on things. But that's actually how I feel. And fuck Right. It. So my last question. You grew up in Hollywood. Obviously, you have famous parents. Uh, I have an apology from New York Magazine to you uh, about Nepo Baby. Um, you've, called, you've had a lot to say about it, and, and you called uh, show business the show-off business. So I brought you some swag. <laughs> <laughs> you, for you. you think I'm going to wear this? Yes. I'm hoping, I'm hoping you have grandchildren. I don't have grandchildren But yet. you will. Okay, that's very sweet. Thank you very they much. They say Nepo Baby on it. Explain yes. that for people. What's so... They say Nepo Baby. Uh, New York Magazine did an article um, questioning um, um, the, 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 the talent of, the ch a lot of the children of. And it's been something that's followed me around m much of my life. And, you know, I've been an actor as, uh, since I was 19 years old, and I've been hustling since then. I'm 64. And it's, it's around. It became kind of a joke. I don't actually feel that way. I don't think there's a person in here who's sitting there going like, well, because she's Tony Curtis and Janet Lee's daughter, she's sitting on that stage today. I don't think you believe that. No. I think you believe it because I've hustled for a long time um, doing a lot of different things um, because... Uh, that's just why I think it's fun. Very yeah. cute. Thank you for my gift. Yeah. And, <laughs> you don't have to um, keep it. I'm, I'm, I'm the one with all the children, but go ahead. I was going to say you're the one <laughs> yeah. with the children. So for me, it's not really a thing. It's, it's, um, it's, it's whatever. It doesn't well, talk matter. Talk about that hustle because you called show business. The sh I show, call it show, show off, off business. business. Explain that. I just, you know, I try not to take it too seriously. It's a business. It's the arts. Um, we can get very laudatory and intellectual about it. Uh, there is, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of intellectual um, ideas and, and constructs within show-off business. And really it's the entertainment business. And I'm in the entertainment business. And I've just called it show-off business because I also like to crack wise. And I try not to take anything too seriously, as you could kind of tell. Um, when is your movie with Tom Cruise? I'm super I told him I'd like to play his mother. I said, <laughs> I said, Tom, come on. Come on, me is your mom. Let's go. But uh, he hasn't called. Okay. On that note, thanks. Jamie Lee Curtis, Donna. Thank Langley. you, Donna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,